بالتعاون برعاية المجلس الثقافي الوطني وتحت عنوان نظرة عبر النافذة كيفيات إدراكنا وتفسيرنا للمجتمع والثقافة عن طريق الأدب معنا تيم ماكنتوش سميث تيشاني دوشي مارينا ليوكيا ومريم السعدي وتقديم أنيتا ساتي Good afternoon everybody and um, thank you so much for joining us for this session Peering Through the Window which is a, a panel part of the UK Country Focus organised by the British Council and I'm delighted to introduce four of the leading writers at work today who each have a distinctive original voice and yet they're united by, this, by the fact that their books all open a window onto a different world often a world which has rarely been captured in the pages of literature and so the format of the session will be, I'll briefly introduce the authors, followed by a discussion between us. And at the end, there'll all be time for questions from you. So um, first, um, just to my left, we have Tim McIntosh Smith, traveler, writer, lecturer, Arabist. For, born in the UK for almost 30 years, he's lived in Yemen. In May 2011, he was named by Newsweek as one of the 12 finest travel writers of the past 100 years. His first book, Yemen, Travels in Dictionary Land, won the 1998 Thomas Cook Daily Telegraph Travel Book Award, and he's written a trilogy exploring the fascinating journeys of the 14th century Moroccan traveller Ibn Battuta. The Daily Telegraph wrote, Macintosh Smith has all the assets a travel writer needs, erudition, rather subversive good humour and a descriptive eye capable of sketching complex details in a few telling lines. And then we have Marina Levitska, who was born in a refugee camp in Germany in 1946 and moved to England with her family when she was a year old. She spent most of her life then trying to become a writer and finally succeeded to phenom phenomenally in 2005 with the hugely acclaimed A Short History of Tractors in Ukrainian, which has sold more than a million copies in the UK alone. This was followed by Two Caravans, We Are All Made of Glue, and her latest novel, Various Pets, Alive and Dead, which received huge acclaim and described, for example, by the New Statesman as, uh, thank heavens for Marina Levitska, whose new novel made me laugh at least once in every chapter. The warmth of its tone, its zest, its blend of quirky, humane comedy and intellectual seriousness make this a novel to treasure. So we'll hear, that, hear more about that in just a minute. And then we have Tishani Doshi, acclaimed poet, novelist, dancer, and who was born in, lives in Madras, India, and is the product of two cultures. Her debut collection of poetry, Countries of the Body, was published in 2006 and won the prestigious Forward Prize for Best First Collection. Her debut novel, The Pleasure Seekers, was published by Bloomsbury in the UK and the USA and Penguin India. It's been translated into German, Spanish, Italian, French, Serbian, Croatian and Polish. Mariam Al Saidi was born in 1974 and is a graduate of UAE University, Aberdeen University in Scotland and the American University of Sharjah. A rising young literary talent her two collections of short stories are Mariam and the Good Fortune, and her third collection of short stories will soon be published under the title Sacred Feelings. So I wanted to start first by asking, you, you, both exp you all explore different cultures and societies in fascinating ways, and I wanted to ask what first drew you to explore worlds very different from the ones in which you grew up, and what were the main challenges facing you in doing that? How was I drawn to exactly. writing about other cultures? By, by living in another culture. Uh, as you said, I've lived in Yemen for, for 30 years. Uh, I have a friend in the, in the front row who I've known for quite a few of those 30 years. Uh, and I went to learn the language. And then, actually, some of you may know Edna O'Brien, the great uh, Irish novelist. She came to Sana'a, where I live, and I showed her around. And she said, um, she said, do you know, I won't try to do her voice, she said, do you know it's a crime to live in a place like this and not to write about it? It's a crime to live in a place like this and not write about it. And if anyone, if you know Sana'a at all, other than Dr. Nazar, um, it, it is an amazing place. 
and I took her words uh, at face value. And um, because I had the, some Arabic. Uh, thank you. How is that? Oh, gosh, oh, that's yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Sinatra. Um, and because I had Arabic, uh, all my colleagues, when I worked for the British Council, said, yes, yes, you're a fool to live here and not to try and write about it. And I really took it as uh, a mission to try and, and translate or interpret Yemen for people who didn't know it. I, I always remember there was a piece in the Daily Telegraph, the, the British newspaper, uh, which said, oh, in the souk in Sana'a, you can buy a bazooka and you can try it out. And I mean, this uh, is, was such patent rubbish uh, that I set out to try and correct this. So that's really how I got into it, through language, um, through falling in love with the place, through wanting to tell people why I loved it. Uh, and that's Yemen. As far as Ibn Battuta, the traveler, goes, that's a wider thing. It's an attempt to interpret or translate a whole uh, culture. But um, let's hand it. Thank you. Can you hear me like this, or shall I? Oh, this is better, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I just feel like breaking into song. So for me, um, writing about a different culture wasn't something I chose. It was something that happened because my parents came from somewhere else. They came from Ukraine um, during, well, they came during the war and they were taken into labor to work, uh, into Germany to work as forced laborers in the German munitions industry. And that's how at the end of the war I was born in a refugee camp. And my parents were really very fortunate that they were among those um, from the East who were allowed to stay in the West rather than being sent back to the East. So I arrived um, in England as a child. And you know, as a child, you don't really question anything. You just accept the world that's around you as though it's perfectly normal. And it wasn't until I started going to school that I became aware, or the other children very soon made me aware, that I wasn't like everybody else. My family were a bit different. I wore different clothes. We had different food at home. And I found it all terribly embarrassing because the one thing you want as a child is to fit in and to be like everybody else. So I, I attribute that really early experience to why I've become a writer. Because when you want to be like everybody else, you become very watchful. So I started to observe, you know, these English people. And how do they talk? What do they wear? What do they eat? What do I have to do to be like them? And at the same time, of course, I was quite a solitary child. I spent a lot of time on my own and reflecting on what I'd learned about these other people. So in a way, um, it wasn't so, I didn't choose to peer through a window, but I was born um, peering through a window and wanting more than anything to be the person on the other side of the window. And, you know, as I got older, maybe I've achieved it and maybe it just doesn't seem so important anymore. Thank you. Past the mic. Um, I think for me as well, I had the similar experience of growing up and feeling quite different because I'm, I'm half Welsh and half Indian. And it's interesting, there was actually a line in Marina's book, which I've just finished, which says, um, see how we grew up in the same house but lived in different countries. And I often felt that about my sister and me because she didn't notice... Well, for her, the fact that my mother was white and different from other people's mothers didn't dawn on her until she was 14. But I think I had that since I was three, that we were different. And it was not in a bad way, it was just uh, recognizing that difference. And I, I do think that's probably what brought me to being a writer as well, because you have this acute sense of standing outside somehow and trying to understand what's going on, because other people have other people have religions that they follow and things that they do and everything is set in a particular way and, and you're sort of neither here nor there, which was very uncomfortable, but now it's something that I've embraced. Um, in terms of what I write about, I think um, one of the things that was interesting to me is that I came to writing about my own culture or definitely my first novel, which was a reinvention of my family history through another culture. because. 
my first trip away from home, I was 17 and I landed in uh, the southern part of United States. And it was the most foreign, strange experience of my life in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I had a reverse culture shock. Most people go away and they have a culture shock. But I, had, I just thought, where am I? What's going on? What, what are these new rules and new people? And I grew to read a lot of the southern fiction of Faulkner and Eudora Welty and Capote and, you know, Flannery O'Connor. And, and there was something violent and comic and wonderful about that literature that made me then say, okay, I can write using this, but about my own stories, which are still about folklore and family and the same darkness, really, that exists, but everyone pretends that everything is happy, so. I write, uh, the question about writing about the other cultures, I don't know, I think um, it's in UAE here uh, different uh, because the others are always here, all of them, we have, uh, it's a cosmopolitan city and we have different cultures uh, from all over the world, we, st we, we grow up with with different people from different cultures, with the whole world, uh, in our country, we see you, any nationality you can imagine in the world, they are here, and we meet them, and we, I personally uh, uh, tend to look at them as the same. I never see the other human as an, the other culture. It's, it's natural in me to think that we just took the same, we look like each other. And when I'm writing about your experience, actually, because it touched me because I'm touched and I want to express it because I felt it. I felt it as mine, not as you, as an other. Uh, growing up, I started to realize that maybe for others, I'm the other, although it's my country, because being minority here and um, with all these different characteristics of being Arabs and wearing uniform for the whole people, there's black for women, white for guys, and and um, I've started to realize that it 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 really it really makes you look different. Although I didn't feel it, and I don't feel it. Um, literature, I believe, writing made me made me think that it's the way to bridge all these feelings of differences between all of us here, and we need to mingle to 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 get to know each other and to see each other's uh, less as other, as the other and more like. The same. Uh, it's we need the the not being local minor community closed and reserved, and with all those different rich and inspiring cultures here, uh, they are uh, really worth writing about. Writing about. I I think I have I have been writing about them uh, in all my uh, short stories, and actually there are three collections of short stories. Uh, when I wrote that biography, it wasn't my third was it wasn't come yet, but. Now it's here in the book fair. No, I, I, I just wanted to pick up on the point of, uh, on, on, on your point of, of feeling a connection with people who are apparently different through writing. And uh, I, I had a sort of almost a, a sacred moment when I realized this with my, what I was writing about, Ibn Battuta. Now, he, he was a Moroccan who lived, uh, he wrote his his great book 650 years ago. And I finally got to see the, the sort of the first fair copy of his book. And it was written in 1357 by his editor. Uh, and it's in the, the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris. And so there was this really sacred object. I was turning the pages and I suddenly saw where the scribe had been dipping his pen in the ink. And he was going dip, write five or six words, dip, write six or seven, four or five. And it was suddenly like looking over the shoulder of, uh, of somebody writing a book, as I write books now. I mean, I may type them up on the computer, but it was suddenly this connection between the, these two writers over, over, what is it, two thirds of a millennium. Um, looking at another person as a, as, a, as a human being, a fellow writer struggling with words, even though he was from a, a different culture. Um, and then I had another little revelation. As I turned one of the pages, it caught the sunlight, and I realized there was a, a watermark, you know, this, this, um, these marks that you get in banknotes, and this paper was watermarked. 
and the librarian who was there watching that I wasn't going to cut out a page and steal it. Um, uh, actually, she was very nice, um, Marie Gaston. She said, um, she said, oh, did you see the watermark? And we both said it, we saw it at the same time. And she rushed off and got a book of very old watermarks. And we dated the paper. It was made two years before the book was written in Venice. So here was a book that was written in Fez in Morocco on paper bought from Venice. And there's me looking at the guy dipping his ink, his pen in the ink. And it was such a moment of connection and such a, a, a window uh, into that other culture and into another time. Interesting. outsider and uh, how in a way should I take that this on, on this theme of the outsider and how in a way it can be quite a painful position to be in Marina you describe the sense of embarrassment growing up and your new novel also ends with the word ouch <laughs> but also it's quite paradoxical in that the outsider can also be a powerful position to be in as Tashani you mentioned that it, it gave you greater insight into the world in which you were living. I wondered whether you think in some way that all writers are outsiders and if you could speak more about that, the paradox of the powerful insights that it, it's given you. Uh, Tim, you were speaking about the theme of transcendence in terms of time as well. Yeah, um, the outsider. I, I remember interviewing Anita Desai as many years ago and I asked her what it was like to grow up in a hill station in North India being half German and half Indian. And she said, you know, yes, we were different, but it was okay. Like, um, you know, nobody made a big deal about it. In, in, in that was her point. And when I asked her about home and what she considers home because she travels so much and she's lived in different places. She really sort of said, well, the position of the outsider is to take the angled stance and just to, the writer, sorry, and, and that is very much the outsider's position as well, that you need to be at a distance in some way so that you can see the picture clearly. And, and I think um, while there is especially now with so many people moving and, and the question of identity and home and where we begin and where we end up, they're, they're, they're so much in flux. But as a writer, the thing that I've done is to sort of embrace that and to say, well, I like being the outsider. And if I ever get too comfortable in a place, then I tend to leave it just because I think that disconnect is what forces you to see again clearly whatever it is you're examining. Thank you. Um, I, I, I agree. I, I, I've got used to being an outsider and I quite like it. And actually, really, now I'm not so much of an outsider anymore. But I think, and to come back to the point that you made, Mariam, I think it's, it's very true that, that as a writer, you're in, in a position not only to describe what you see, but to, to give other people the opportunity to see the world through somebody else's eyes. And, you know, for the duration of the book, you know, however long it takes to read, you know, a day or two or a week, you can experience what it's like to be that other person, see how that other person sees the world. And it's really, it's really the most wonderful thing that you can do. And, and it is true that doing that is reading and, and writing are the things which make us realize how much we have in common with people who appear to be different. And so what I've chosen to write about people who seem to be different and who seem to be outsiders um, often it's very precisely because I'm interested in finding out what it is beneath the surface that we all have in common and the things which are, um, you know, which make us uniquely human, really. I agree with you. I've never had that moment with the watermark and the pen, but I very often have um, that feeling reading poetry that was written even in the Middle Ages, that there's a word or an emotion or something which I recognize as, as something that I feel as well myself. And I feel so close to somebody who lived, you know, as you say, hundreds of years ago. And I think how fantastic it is that we can share these moments of humanity with people who appear to be different. And, you know, maybe um, th th this is one thing that we can do as writers without even trying, is to realize um, how much we have in common with others and to help other people to realize how much we all have in common with others. Can, can I come in there? You, you mentioned poetry, and, and uh, 
for various reasons, I've just been translating some very, very early Arabic poetry, uh, Emin al-Qais. And, um, you know, this is 6th century, early 6th century, 1500 years old. And somebody it was, I, it might have been al-Jahiz, and I can't remember who, who said that poetry is what you understand before you get the meaning of the words. And I mean, it's, it's that that is the transcendent thing, all the view through the window. And the fact that here is uh, somebody writing 1500 years ago who was a, a, essentially a sort of Bedouin prince, um, writing actually quite difficult stuff to translate. I mean, he, trans he, he compares his, the hair of his beloved to, uh, to the hanging bunches of dates. And it, it sounds quite strange in English because you think of dates being sticky. Um, but you suddenly get the right word in English, and I think I translated it as uh, bunches of the palm tree fruit. Um, and then you're suddenly in the mind and in the culture of this, of this ancient, ancient person. And I think poetry is a very direct way. It's a kind of uh, super highway uh, through the window. Actually, I've been the outsider myself all the time. Sometimes it depends from different, uh, different uh, angles you see it uh, sometimes. And I discovered that when I talk about myself, I use the first point of view in writing and uh, describe the feelings of an outsider or a different or a strange person or freak or whatever. I found all those uh, uh, feedback and replies from, from different people telling, saying, oh, as if you are talking about me. So when you say, when you start, uh, when you start being the outsider, the whole, <laughs> the other will start feeling that they are outsiders too. So you end up, nobody is an outsider actually. Could I quote something just apropos? Of, and and it, it's a bit, it's a few lines of Kipling of all people. Does anyone, does anyone read Kipling? Sure. Not anymore. Some people do. Some people are shaking, are, are, are nodding their heads. Uh, and it's so much what you just said, Mariam, that, um, and it's from a poem, I think it's called For to Admire, and it's an, it's an old soldier coming home, and he's talking about the world, and he said, it's so much more near than I had known, so much more great than I had guessed, and me, like all the rest, alone, but reaching out to all the rest. And it's that idea of being alone, and yet the fact that you're alone is what makes you reach out. Yep. Yep. Read Kipling. There's more to him yes. than, you, than you think. I'm sure you're right. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lovely quote. And, and Kipling also has his famous poem, If, about the unforgiving minute. And so uh, look on the theme of time. I think we've got about... Uh, 10 minutes left to chat and then we'll open it up to questions from you. And I was going to quote something else which was an epigraph from Landfalls. Um, Make mankind everywhere your dwelling place and look upon the whole world as your home. And uh, on, on, Marina, you mentioned the, kind of the paradox of getting, reaching a universality through the particular lives and details you described. And I wanted to ask about your, the vehicle with which you convey these other societies and cultures in your particular style and uh, language because I know you work in multiple different forms Tishani you write poetry novels and um, what for you are the virtues and vices of each of the particular forms that you work in including travel narrative and fiction and Marina I know you used to write poetry as a very young child as well <laughs> I did write poetry but my poetry was about rabbits which aren't <laughs> very much outsiders well they're outsiders of some things but they're often inside the cooking pot worse for them um, I think the um, I've always been interested, having started out as an outsider myself, outsiders feature, I think, in all of my books. Um, the, the short history of tractors in Ukrainian essentially is about Ukrainians living in Britain. And the thing that um, was interesting for me in writing that is that there are, um, when there are really, if you go back far enough, everybody's a migrant from somewhere. And so one of the things that that book looks at is the the difference between the migrants who've been somewhere for a while and who feel settled and how they feel about the new arrivals who, you know, they're really terribly critical of. And the, you, 
we have this wonderful phrase in Yorkshire, we call them blow-ins. Do you know, that's like somebody who's just blown in on the wind. And really in Yorkshire, if you've lived there for less than 20 years, you're still considered a blow-in. Um, but, but, in Yorkshire? Blow-in. Blow <laughs> but... Um, in, in the next book, The um, Two Caravans, it was, it was about people who hadn't really come to England to settle at all. They'd simply come to work. And, you know, um, in England, or the United Kingdom, I should say, a bit like um, Abu Dhabi and Dubai and like the Emirates, um, d depends enormously on the, work of, on the work of other people from other parts of the world who um, work terribly hard, often invisibly. They often work at night, um, you know, they're the people who are on the roads at six o'clock in the morning. You'll see traffic jams, and they're they're people sitting in crammed in minibuses, going off to work in the fields to pick the fruit, or they're up there sh stacking the shelves of the supermarket before the shoppers get in, or they're tucked away in you know in awful sort of um, factory places on the outskirts of town. And so I. I really um, wanted to make this invisible world a little bit more visible and to give people who often don't have a voice um, a voice. So then my third book looked at a, looked at a different um, sort of community within England, which is both um, the, the protagonist is a Jewish woman um, who then comes in contact with um, a Palestinian. And the Palestinian has two sons. The Jewish woman has a son. And somehow they all manage to well, not exactly live together, but they have a lot of fun together and cause a lot of chaos together. And um, so again, it was looking at outsider communities within Britain. By the time I got to write my fourth book, Various Pets Alive and Dead, I thought, well, enough of that. You know, I don't want to be pigeonholed as somebody who only writes about outsiders. So um, I thought, I'll write about insiders. I'll write about the banking industry and people who've lived um, in Britain, all, you know, people of the 60s generation, like myself, and um, people who'd lived in the commune in Britain. But once I started to look into it, what I found is that international fina uh, the finance is the most international industry in Britain. Forget your migrant strawberry pickers, forget your shelf stackers. It's the banks of England which are stuffed with the workers from all over all over the world. The most talented of every country in the world have been creamed off and put to work in these, um, as I describe them, money mills. So even there, um, I found that it was, it was a theme that I couldn't escape. And so I left with the conclusion, we're all living in somebody else's country. We're all mixed up. And actually, um, we all have much more in common than we thought we had. Okay. My first book of poems was called Countries of the Body and that was sort of coming out of working as a dancer and I was trying to sort of flip this discussion about actual countries and, but just to say well we move around with our own bodies without really understanding much about it because I became a dancer at the very late age of 26 which most people are, ballet dancers are hanging up their shoes by then but I started my dance career then and I realized that as a woman and as a just you know somebody who's been a, walking the planet for that many years I knew very little about my own body and so I would say that the first book was this deep examination of of physical body but also body as a metaphor for movement and country and disappointment and betrayal and all of those things and the novel which is something, again, reflecting back to what Marina said. You know, I come from these two, what would seem quite odd, different backgrounds. Welsh, like my mother's from a village in North Wales, and basically her whole village could fit into an apartment building in Bombay, you know. And uh, I grew up not in Bombay, but in Madras, which is 8 million people. It's a huge, big city. Um, and yet it still feels like a village at times to me, this place. And when I was sort of trying to go into this family history a bit and think what it might have been for my mother to bring the first brown man to her village in North Wales way back in 1969, I thought, you know, it must have been a shocking thing. But then, because they were so different, but then when I spent time with my father's family, my aunts and uncles, and then I spent time with my mother's family, I suddenly had a moment sitting in Wales in this auntie's house that these aunts and uncles could very well have been 
my father's aunts and uncles because they were talking about the same things. When are you going to get married? What so-and-so's daughter going to do? You know, it, it was the sense of sameness in a completely different environment. And that moment, I realized this thing, this thing that the basic human questions are the same whenever you ask them and wherever you ask them. And so that was a kind of moment for me in, in my writing career to say, okay, we have to also, while highlighting the difference and while exploring those because they are interesting and they do make us look at our own stories differently, realize that actually it's the same story that's been going on and on and on. Yeah, you, you, you just made me think about, um, I, I always harp on about Ibn Battuta, the, the great Arab traveler. Um, but it is because of that feeling that we are the same uh, that he works as a, as a window into the Islamic world as a whole. I mean, there's this terrible word, iconic, which is used left, right, and center of every, you know, the Burj al-Arab is, is iconic, and I don't know what, uh, what's iconic in Abu Dhabi. Uh, you know, big, uh, the mosque is icon iconic, Big Ben is iconic, and, um, but for Ibn Battuta, there is no word other than iconic which is suitable for him. And one of the reasons is that he is not different from you and me. You know, he, go, he goes and meets the height of his career. He meets the Sultan of Delhi and gets this wonderful job, hugely paid. And he says, uh, I couldn't stay very long because I had a boil on my buttock. And, you know, nobody else at that time wrote about having boils. He writes about falling in love. He writes about losing everything and having diarrhea. And so here's this guy who does exactly what we all do when we travel. Um, and yet he is a, a Muslim of the 14th century. And it's that connection, that realization that he is the same, like your different sets of aunts and uncles, um, which, which actually allows us to pass through the window. Actually, when I, um, when I first, I don't know, it, it goes a long, long time ago, when I first started realizing the whole world that there's, I, I, I started seeing the whole world, the sufferings of others, and uh, the, like, for example, starvation in Africa. Uh, last year, last year in, the, in Abu Dhabi Book Fair, I had this discussion, and one of the audience asked me, what do you write? How, how do you find themes to write about in UA? You don't have any struggles, and... Why, what kind of human suffering you are writing about? You don't have any suffering of your own. And the fact is that I never, I never see the, the only, my, 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 my narrow circle, my small circle of uh, UAE, I always looked at the humanity and whatever is affecting the humanity, I always felt it affecting me. So I started just, I started feeling that I have to express this, I have to participate, I have, it's, it's not because I think that my participation will do any difference, it's just because I feel that it makes me feel easier. And so it's actually, it's a selfish, you know, after all, it's about uh, self-comfort. Uh, but uh, it, it, it has been always there inside me that I want to I wanna express this. And um, that's my first book was also about the, the uh, as I said before, that we have the whole world here in UAE and becoming friends with all those people and hearing their stories and what brought them here. And for example, there is this, a guy from Africa who just, uh, he's, he was telling me his story that he's coming here he, three years, 30 years ago uh, because he wanted to buy some uh, electrical uh, fan for his house and he said now I'm here for 30, I didn't still <laughs> buy it and I cannot go back and, uh, and I'll, I, you know the feeling of homelessness and still to be, tra to be trapped in, the, in a place you, you don't want to lo lose, you, don't, you, you, can, you cannot stay, you cannot belong totally um, this struggle of identity with others, this love and hate relation with the place and uh, the, the, the meaning of home, what is home, what is, what, what is, what is us? How, how would you translate home into Arabic? Watan. You would say watan? It is watan, yes. So it's not a... House. house. Yeah. It could be house, yeah. But it's watan, like home. Yeah. I sometimes wonder if it's movable, like uh, Aile or... Yeah, well, metaphorically, yes. You can always have your home in your heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and um, these questions, this kind of existential questions, actually that that make no, I want, I am trying to grasp the the these feelings, this. Uh, ties with them and trying to express them. Sometimes I feel I'm lost. I'm not able to express them. But uh, since they are there, uh, in the, they are start. They are. They keep knocking on my back head. That that means oh, there's something coming. I have to. Once I I, I sit and write and just on the white paper, I found all these characters there appearing, even with their with their names. I don't know those names from where they came, long names, and I just put them as if there are people telling me to write their stories. They are here, nobody knows about them. People here come to work, not to live, so they want to make life even just if not, if just in paper. So, you know, lots of questions, questions, uh, ideas, and I hope one day I can put them in a novel, in some more constructive work than uh, short stories. Hopefully. Thank you. I wondered if anyone in the audience has any questions. If so, please put up your hand and we'll, we'll have a, a microphone roving around. Any questions? Or? Yes, we have one there. Um, so, Ali, Maryam, I was telling you that the short stories are hopefully one day to put in a novel so that you can tell us the story. السؤال انه القصه القصيره مش قادره هي توفي حق القصه للشخص اللي عم تخبري او الحدث اللي عم تخبري عنه سوري مريم اي جست بوت ذس ان انجلش اند ذن يو كان ماي ماي كويشن واز تو مريم شي واز توكينج اباوت شو ستوريز اند شي سيد ذات هوبفولي وان داي شي واز جوين تو بوت ذس انتو ا نوفل ماي كويشن واز واي داز ذا اور دازنت ذا ذا شو ستوري جيف ذا Um, tell the story, let's say, of uh, tell completely what she needs to say. Um, does she have to put it in a novel? Does the novel um, tell the story of the person or, or of the event or, or whatever the, the writer wants to talk about? Does it tell it in a better way? Yes, uh, I understand the question that you want. Isn't a short story is enough? Uh, actually, I always wanted to write a novel for the magic of the novel itself because I loved reading novels since you know childhood and I thought I'd always be a novelist. But uh, when I started practicing, uh, I also started with novels, uh, crazy novels, but when I was in uh, school and I distributed, I didn't publish them, of course. I thought if uh, I did, maybe they would be bestsellers by now. Anyway, I'm kidding, they won't. Uh, sh the short story, when I started writing, I discovered that the idea is there, is full. And, it, and when I feel that the idea is there, I stop. I st always started to write a novel, and it actually became a short story. I feel there is, uh, if there is no need for one more word to add to it, I shouldn't. I just feel stop, that's it. Exactly. So I kept, I'm, I'm still writing short stories. This is what I'm saying. But the, see what the, all the celebrations about the novels. Every who, who who buys short stories collections here? I I even try to publish. You know, when I try to publish my third uh, collection of short stories, I send it to different Arab publishers. The the quick reply reply was, sorry, we don't publish short stories because they're short. Because nobody buy them. People are interested <laughs> in uh, novels more, and I don't know. Uh, maybe different uh, reasons the publishers have. So it is it is. Uh, there is no atmosphere for them. There is maybe, maybe if there is, if there is ev not even a prize for the short stories. The book are just for the novels. So, um, if, still, it is a dream. I don't know if it will be, it will be fulfilled or not. Maybe I'll just be a short story writer be for all my life. Maybe I don't have the patience for uh, writing a novel. Maybe it's not in me. So, um, but I have nothing personally against short stories. I love short stories. Exactly. I, 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 I buy short stories and from publishers and they say, You're the, uh, not many buy short stories collection. Maybe this is a culture that needs to be changed by the publishers, by the cultural authorities, officially or uh, uh, others. But uh, I don't know. Thank, Thank you for you. the question. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, actually, this question could be for anybody, for everybody, and it's more like a comment slash question. Tim, I found it uh, fascinating what you said about what made you start writing. Your friend telling you that it's a sin to be living in a place like this and not writing about it. Um, I happen to write the fact that I feel like it's a sin living in a place like Mother Earth and not writing about it. 
So I was wondering if you guys have any thoughts about that. I think, um, I, I, I think it's a very difficult question because it's true that I'm one of those people that feels I should be writing, but I don't know what gives me that right or that entitlement because I think a lot of people feel that they would like to be writers and I just think I'm very lucky. Um, I, I don't think sin comes into it quite. Though it's true that the world is indeed a fascinating place and it's good that somebody writes about it. Well, I think there are many, many ways of expressing and, and writing is one of them. And I've always said that if I could paint or if I could sing, I would rather do that, but I can't. So I'll do what I can do and that's to write. I, I just the same. If I can ride a horse, for example, I wouldn't ride, so it's more fun. <laughs> I just do it because this is what I can do. I think maybe I'm mistaken. And, and, and I would say that the, the real sin or the real crime is not not to write, but it's not to read. So thank you all. I, I mean, no, this sounds like the final comment. Uh, it's not the fight. So thank you all for being readers. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, we are sort of, our publishers say, oh, but nobody will want to read that, or, um, so we, and they do. I mean, I, my publisher, I, 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 I've written what are called travel books, they're kind of more than travel. I'm working on a thriller at the moment, and the first thing my publisher said was, oh, how do I know you can write a story? Um, but as long as the readers, you are, out there, you, you, you are the ones who give us meaning. That's very true. Thank you. <laughs> My question is a, is a bit specific just for Tishani. Um, when you're traveling to events like this, do you ever feel a pressure of sorts to be an Indian writer? As in, you have to be the window into an Indian culture. You must be writing about that and interpret this Well, I'm here culture. as a British writer. I understand that. I know that. <laughs> which I'm very happy about. But no, what I find more than an Indian, it's being an Indian woman. That people are very interested about. Um, and they always want to know what's the position of Indian women, how are they doing, is it better than it used to be, is, the, is it changing, is there still dowry, is there still sati, is, you know, all these questions. And I feel like a um, little bit uncomfortable being a, a sort of, not ambassador, but to be a spokesperson about that because that's not like I'm not an economist or a, or a or a social worker or you know I'm a I'm a writer so I do write about women I do look at things through the prism of women but I did have a breakdown once in Italy because they kept on asking me you know and I, I said I don't think if there were three American writers if there was Jonathan Safran Foer and uh, Dave Eggers and another young trendy American writer on stage that you are going to ask them what it is to be a young American man or what is this you know it's just uh, it's yeah you ask them about their work and so in some way I feel that there's a lot of when you when you're put into a particular box whether it's Indian woman or Arab woman or which must be even another minority you know then you're answering more for a general subject and less about what you would rather speak about which is your work I think and so sometimes it's it's frustrating but I think it's it's also a way of you know people want to know so uh, it's an opportunity to say what you want to say about it I'm very often invited to places because people think I'm going to be a Ukrainian writer. And then I turn up and I speak so very English. Um, and people are always a little bit disappointed. <laughs> you, you've, you've done a very good job. When you were, you know, when you were little, and you, you didn't want to be different. No, you've, you've done a very good job. And, and Tishani, when, when you talked about uh, your mother coming from a Welsh village, you su the, the Welshness suddenly came out, um, but no, the, these labels, going on to labels, I, I've just read, some of you have, I'm sure have read it, uh, by Fouad uh, Ajami, the American Lebanese uh, guy, and, and he wrote a book called, uh, um, no, hang on, I've got it wrong, some, whoever wrote Beyond Islam, and, and they, and they talked about everyone writing about Islamic architecture, Islamic history, as, uh, and, and they said, 
do, do people write about Christian architecture? Christian? No, it's uh, it's it, it is a label, and, and and really what we're trying to do is peel the labels away and uh, reveal the the naked truth underneath. Not too much peeling. All right. <laughs> Do we have one, I think we've got time for one more question, yes? Um, my question is really for all of you, and it's about um, what I call the Howard Carter moment that you might have had in your lives. Now, to give the, the question some context, Howard Carter discovered uh, Tutankhamun in 1924, um, and this is the only um, uh, ancient Egyptian burial which would remain undisturbed since antiquity, so it was a, a remarkable um, a, a discovery. But what happened was that when he, um, he cleared a couple of stones at the top of the, uh, the chamber, the door to the chamber, and he, he thrust a light inside, and his assistant said, can you see anything? And he said, I can see wonderful things. And I just wondered if there was a moment, uh, because you're all obviously, um, you know, uh, creative people, whether there was a moment in your lives when you had that Howard Carter moment, when you could suddenly see beyond uh, your life as it was at the moment and see some things which were wonderful. I was going to say, I, th I think that my Howard Carter moment probably happened when I was four and I saw these rabbits. And they became not just rabbits, but they became rabbits I could write about. Um, and it's, it's true. I think one of the things about growing up in a bilingual household, actually, is that my parents spoke one language, and as soon as I went to school, I spoke another. And that language, and that English, which I had, which I, I mean, actually, my father spoke extremely good English and was even a translator, but nevertheless, the English that I learned was not, also not the English that my father knew. And so it became, that was my Howard Carter moment, if you like. It was the thing which was mine that actually I didn't share with anybody else in my family and which gave me, um, it, it brought me the rabbits. No, I, I th thank you, because you, you reminded me, I don't know how, but what my Howard Car Car Carter moment was. Um, somebody taught me at school, Mr. Hutchinson. Um, is he here? It might, yeah, Hutchin Rabbit, you're brilliant. This is, this is why you sold a million copies. Um, I don't think I've ever sat next to an author who sold a million copies. Um, and that is not said with any degree of envy at all. Um, no, Mr. Hutchin, Mr. R Hutchinson, Hutchinson. Uh, I had a great rival in Mr. Hutchinson's English classes, uh, and he was called Snowy Owen. He had sort of very light blonde hair, and we were always rivals against each other. And one day, uh, Mr. Hutchinson gave us both 11 out of 10 for something we had written. And he'd never done that before, and nobody's ever given it to me since. Uh, and I think I thought, God, I can write. I can write. You know, I can do something with this. So that was my looking at the, the glittering prizes. I'm trying to think of um, a Howard Carter moment for my writing, but I... It's sort of like with the completion of each poem or book or something, I suppose, or even to get the idea. But I think my main moment was as a dancer because I had this performance in, uh, in a kind of, well, a UNESCO site in Gujarat. And uh, we had a rehearsal and the whole village came out to see us, you know, grandfathers and babies and mothers and husbands. And it's like 700 people. And I'd never been on stage before. And this was my first performance. And every time I lifted a hand or a leg or made them, they clapped. And um, I, I, it was like an out-of-body experience. I, I felt like I was watching myself and I felt I was in some other place. And later on, my dance teacher, my mentor, she said, you know, you'll never get an audience like that ever in your life. And she was right. <laughs> I, I, I think that was it, yeah. but I'm happy to have had it. Yes. I don't know, I don't think I ever have this moment. I, it didn't just happen to me. I, I always took it for granted that I'd write and uh, it's like something casual and usual and most normal things to happen. That's why it's, maybe it's not happening that much. <laughs> well, uh, um, yeah, well, who knows? On, on that note, thank you all so much for a fascinating discussion and for opening the windows into your writing life. And thank you all so much for coming and for your own insightful questions. 
Thank you to the British Council and the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair. And the author's books will be on sale as well. So if you haven't already read them, I'd highly recommend doing so because they're, they're some of the, the best books I've ever read. And um, do also go along to the author's uh, other sessions, which will be taking place throughout the week. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you all. Thank you.